The story of what went on inside the collapse of the American financial system begins on the ground with risky mortgages and leads all the way to Wall Street offices, where the lucrative financial deals being created out of these mortgages boggle the mind. My reaction to these complicated products was that it was hocus pocus, that in fact, it was trying to create something out of nothing. Those products were created by a complex chain made up of many players, from local bankers and brokers to Wall Street analysts and deal makers. But there was one group that could have put on the brakes, the credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor's, Moody's Corporation, and Fitch Ratings. Without their blessing, none of these complicated deals could have gone forward. If they had stood up and said, we're not going to do it, then the other players would have been forced to cut back. But everyone was having too good a time. And it's a story whose unraveling has led to an investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission and Congress. The story of the credit rating agencies is a story of a colossal failure. You are the gatekeepers. You're the guys. That's why you're there. And so we are now we face a situation where we've got a house of cards that have, has fallen. Once upon a time, credit rating agencies had a solid reputation for providing an independent analysis about the safety of investments through a scale of letter grades. AAA is the safest, like a U.S. Treasury bond. The lower the grade, the riskier it is. General Motors this week, for example, is way down here in the triple C's. It used to be that AAA was gold, and you could generally count on a AAA rating to mean that this company is not going to default, that you will not lose all of your money. Frank Partnoy, a former Wall Street trader turned law professor at the University of San Diego, is considered an expert in financial markets. The credit rating agencies and credit ratings were really at the center of the crisis. To understand why, you need to understand how Wall Street has transformed the mortgage industry over the past 25 years. Wall Street figured out that mortgages could be a big money maker, and that idea morphed into a new class of complex financial investments. Partnoy agreed to try to break it down for us. A, a bank, a financial institution, countrywide, for example, made a bunch of loans. And What's going loans on is that thousands of mortgages into are collected into a, a single company. pool called a mortgage-backed security, which is divided up into bonds and sold. But then it gets even more complicated. Riskier sections of the mortgage-backed securities, bonds that are rated triple B, are pooled together in a totally new financial instrument called a CDO, a collateralized debt obligation. Then, through dazzling financial engineering, the majority of the CDO gets a triple A rating. And the magic of the process of taking these triple Bs, and so we'll put a bunch of triple Bs in here, is that even though the underlying investments in the CDO are triple B, the overall rating for the triple B will be magically triple A. Effectively, they were hocus pocus or not. The financial wizards who put these deals together made hefty fees at every link in the chain, including the credit rating agencies. There was such an appetite for these newfangled bonds that by 2003, when the market for traditional mortgages was saturated, lenders turned to more risky loans, subprime mortgages, the ones that people couldn't actually afford. From the year 2000 to 2007, more than $5 trillion was spent buying up mortgage-backed securities and CDOs around the globe. That brings us to a headline, the drive to issue more and more subprime mortgages worth hundreds of billions of dollars came less from would-be homeowners than from Wall Street firms hungry for more fees and more products to sell. And who was buying these products? Everyone from pension funds and 401ks to hedge fund guys, even countries like Iceland. So how is it that conservative investors were willing to buy bonds created from risky subprime mortgages? The answer is credit ratings. The reason they were willing to take these hot potatoes was that the credit rating agencies had said that they're rated AAA, they're rated AA. These are highly rated 
instruments, they weren't hot potatoes, or at least they didn't look like they were hot potatoes. The rating agency said, no, don't worry, these are perfectly safe. We used our fancy complicated models, uh, and we can certify that these are safe enough to be put in your portfolios. Turns out, they weren't. Those AAA-rated CDOs are now considered central to the global financial crisis. Gugliotta says S&P's credit ratings were based on the most complex statistical models written by top PhDs and math geniuses. The problem, Gugliotta asserts, is that they didn't have long-term data on how these new financial instruments would perform over time. We assumed that during bad times, more of them would default. Okay, but we didn't have any historical data to, um, to tell us how bad that could be. So you just said that you didn't have sufficient data to make this huge assumption. Mm -hmm. To me, honestly, it's astounding. If you didn't have the data and you're a data-based credit rating agency, why not walk away? The revenue potential was too large. And keep in mind, the rating agencies are paid by the companies whose bonds they're rating. It's a built-in conflict of interest. The ratings agencies get paid per deal. So there's a conflict of interest. The, the more they rate AAA, the more business they get. How profitable were CDOs for Standard & Poor's? Very profitable. Give me an example. Throw out some numbers there. A typical fee would be something like a quarter of a million dollars per deal. And you were starting to do now how many deals? Uh, during the heydays in the busiest months, we were doing as many as 20, 25 per month. So if you do the math, the CDO division alone was bringing in at least $5 million a month in the busy season. And the CDOs were spreading the wealth to Moody's and Fitch as well. Revenues at the three top rating agencies went from $3 billion in 2002 to over $6 billion in 2007. Was there pressure to keep that money coming in? Yes. All of us, Moody's, S&P, Fitch, we were constantly trying to bring in new business. So where were the regulators in all of this? There was a party going on, and no one wanted to be a party pooper. We had regulators that didn't understand their job. Uh, the job of a regulator has traditionally been to take away the punch bowl when the party gets too raucous, because otherwise the taxpayer is going to wind up cleaning up the mess. Regulators Stiglitz charges were so caught up with Wall Street that they lost sight of Main Street. They bought into this mystique of innovation that somehow we had created something out of nothing. But they hadn't looked at the kinds of innovations that really would have made our economy work better. What were the innovations that people really care about? Well, people want to buy a home and be able to stay in it. They want to be able to manage the risk that they face. The risk of interest rates going up, uh, the risk of their income going down. But Wall Street didn't do that kind of innovation that would have made a lot of difference for a lot of people. So now, after the bubble has burst, all the talk in Washington yes, is about reform. Sorry, and reform is what the credit agencies have promised Congress and the public. We have um, announced a number of actions earlier this year. We need to both revisit our models, uh, seek to rate less complex instruments. We are working very hard to make sure that we can uh, re-instill uh, a sense of trust in the market. Keep in mind that these three CEOs, executives at the one sleepy credit rating agencies, earned $80 million among them over the past six years. The takeaway is that we have developed a peculiar form of capitalism where the wizards of Wall Street walk away with the profits and we, the American people, walk away with the losses.